You'll recall that we said a database was not only an organized collection, but also said that it was a collection of logically related parts. By logically related, we mean that there are associations between the data. Remember how students and library holdings were associated in our prior example. What we need then is a special type of glue to hold the related pieces of the database together. This glue allows us to take paths through the database going from one related part to another so that we can store data in only one place, thus minimizing the chance of errors. These linkages between data are called relationships. Let's see some examples. Customers and orders are related because a customer places orders. Orders and line items are related because an order includes a number of line items. Products and line items are related because products are included on a number of line items. Are customers and products related? Sure they are, but this is an implicit relationship because customers place orders which include line items which have products included on them. The relationship glue allows us to walk a number of relationship paths to find associated data. Neat, huh? Okay, this is a nice picture, but is there a better, more functional way to think about databases? Of course there is. Let's consider two of the entities in our example database, customers and orders. You'll remember that a good way to represent each of these entities is via a table. So here are two sample tables with rows for each customer and order and columns for some of the attributes of customers and orders. What we are missing so far is a way to represent the relationship, places, between customers and orders. If there were only some piece of data that would tell us for each order, who was the customer who placed that order? We already know such an attribute. It's customer ID. So let's add customer ID with its data to the order table along with the other order data. Each order has only one customer ID, so we can easily add this data to the table. Now, because we have customer ID in both tables, what we call a common column, we can relate each order to the associated customer. So order 40 is related to customer 2, order 42 is also related to customer 2, and order 41 is related to customer 3. We don't have to put other customer data like name in each order row because we can find it by taking the path for the places relationship. Taking these relationship paths is called joining in database terminology. The technical term for customer ID attribute in the order table is a foreign key. You can think of it as a cross-reference. What we see here are the main characteristics of the most common way of thinking about a database, the relational database model. So what makes the relational data model so special? In short, simplicity, and parsimony. Let's see why. You might think, wouldn't it be easier if we put all the data that we needed into one table, rather than splitting the data into two tables? Well, what happens? Well, first we have redundancy, and usually extra space consumed because repeated data are usually the largest pieces of data. And we might have errors. We can't ensure that the same customer data, for example, the address for Amber, are entered the same way each time. And we might have anomalies or inconsistencies, such as where would we store data about customers who don't have any orders, for example, customer one? Where would we store data about customers whose last order was deleted, for example, order 41 for customer three? Which customer order data must change when there is a change to customer data? For example, all orders for customer 2. And we need to check that customer 8 really exists. So there must be a cross-reference into the customer table. But we don't lose anything when we have two tables, because we can find the related data 
via the cross-reference. We'll illustrate this later in some sample queries. Actually, we can build a wide variety of databases using the relational model. Although the fundamental principles are the same, they look a little different. We can build databases to run the operations of the business, such as order entry and accounting. We can build analytical databases to support decision making, such as market segmentation and sales forecasting. We can build complex network-like structures of hundreds of tables or simpler structures that look like stars or even cubes. You can think pivot tables from Microsoft Excel. We can even build hierarchical structures that allow us to relate customers, for example, to their geography of state, city, county, country, which allows us to find data at different levels of aggregation. Pretty powerful, huh? With such a powerful concept of relational databases, we need powerful technology to help us access and manage the database. This technology is called a database management system, or DBMS. A DBMS helps us to protect data by, for example, ensuring authorized use via user IDs and passwords and putting data integrity rules in place. To define tables and control performance of the database by applying very technical structures and backing up the database in case the primary copy of data is damaged in some way. To maintain data, which allows us to enter, change, and delete database contents. To retrieve data, which will likely be the bulk of the activity against any database. And to do all these things either through a programming language like SQL, either by itself or with another more general purpose language like Java, or with the help of a more friendly graphical user interface like SQL Assistant, which we saw earlier. Let's see some more examples of using a database, but this time we'll do more complex queries involving data from more than one table, thus taking advantage of the relationship glue that allows us to find related data in a database. Here is our Pine Valley Furniture Company database about customers, their orders, products, and the line items of products on orders. Suppose we wanted to know the names of customers along with the dates and order IDs of all their orders. This query involves data from the customer and order tables. You'll recall the places relationship that links customers with their orders. You may also recall that we showed that the places relationship was implemented in the database by a cross-reference. That is, a customer ID is stored in each row of the order table. This customer ID cross-reference is a foreign key that links each order row to its associated customer. Now we have a pretty good idea what our query will have to do. We want to show or select customer name, order date, and order ID. Somehow tell SQL to match the customer ID in an order with the customer ID in a customer row so we can find the name of the customer for that order. And let's show these in sequence by customer names and order dates within name so the display will be easier to understand. We're using Teradata SQL Assistant again as we did with the previous SQL queries. Later, I'll tell you how you can use SQL Assistant to try your hand at writing queries. Compared to when we used SQL Assistant before, this time we see some additional elements of the SQL Assistant interface. On the left, I have expanded what is called the directory tree so that we can see all the tables in the database and all the columns in the two tables we need for the first query we're going to write, the customer and order tables. This is reference information to remind us of the correct names of tables and attributes to use in the queries. And showing in the middle of the screen, this time, is the history pane. Each time I enter a SQL command, that statement goes into the history and I can recall it into the query panel at any time to help me write another query. Usually history persists for each user but we've set up a special SQL Assistant access for our use. So the history of commands I enter will be forgotten as soon as I exit SQL Assistant. Now for our query. 
Remember what we want to do is to list the names of customers along with the dates and order IDs of all their orders, showing these in sequence by customer names and order dates within name. To show the customer names and the order dates and IDs, we put these into the select statement. Because these attributes come from two tables, customer and order, we have to list both of these tables in the from clause. Now for the new part. We have to tell SQL how to find the row in the customer table that matches each row of the order table. Recall, this is our foreign key of customer ID that is found in both tables. So we'll see that in the order table there's customer ID and in the customer table there's customer ID. So we have a qualification. We want to match an order row with the customer row that has the same value of customer ID, which we do in a WHERE clause. We had to tell SQL where to find each customer ID, so we prefaced each customer ID with the name of the table to use. The final part of our query imposes an output sequence, of first by customer name and then by order date, which happens to be the first and second attributes in our SELECT command. So we can add to our query order by one comma two. We could have said order by customer name comma order date, but wasn't it easier to just use the column position numbers? We then click the execute button and get the result. The critical element of what we just did was to know the customer ID is a common attribute or column in both tables and that we can find matching values to join customer data to order data without having to repeat customer data in every order. In our next SQL example,